this morning. I know there's a lot away in Holland, but I'm glad to see you here when I came in earlier. Uh, there wasn't too many. It's nice to see everyone gathered in, and we do give you a very warm welcome this morning. And thanks so much for coming. We're going to sing our first hymn, uh, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness to Him Who Bore My Pain, Who Flung the Deaths of My Disgrace and Gave Me Life Again, Who Crushed My Curse of sinfulness and clothed me with his light and wrote his law of righteousness with power upon my heart. My heart is filled and I trust this morning that as we come together our heart is filled with thankfulness to God for all that he's given us to us. Let's stand together and we'll sing this hymn. to come into the stillness of this place and to listen and long to hear that still small voice of calm. We were looking there on Thursday night just that you didn't come in the, in, in, in the noise, you didn't come in the earthquake, you didn't come in the fire, but that you came and you spoke in the still small voice. And Lord, that's the very prayer and desire of our heart this morning, that you will come 
and that you will speak to us. We realize that in a group of people you can have different needs. There can be worries, there can be burdens, there can be cares that are weighing heavy upon us. And we thank you as we come into your presence just for the realization that we know you care for us. You know all that we're going through. You know our heart's desires. You know our heart's fears. You know our heart's tribulations. And Lord, you care for us. So we pray, Lord, afresh this morning through the singing of these hymns, through the meeting together around your precious word, as we read it together, as we spend time just thinking and meditating upon it, Lord, that you will meet us at the point of that need. Lord, we pray we've come this morning with open ears, we've come with open minds, and most of all, we've come with open hearts to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we know that you long and you want to meet with us. So Lord, our prayer is that you will have your own way. Our prayer is like Samuel of old, will say, speak Lord, for thy servant here. So thank you for this time we can have together. And Lord, we pray that you'll just bind us Bless us, draw close to us, and whether we're in the service or whether people are looking online, Lord, that you will minister to every heart, every life, and every home. We thank you that we can come before you and ask for, for uh, others to be blessed. And Lord, we look this morning for those who are going through the grieving process, and we pray, Lord, you'll wonderfully be with them. We pray, Lord, you'll help, you'll strengthen, you'll comfort and you'll draw close to them. We think of those who are unwell at this time, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you will draw close to them. We thank you you're the great physician. We thank you you're the one who can touch, and you're the one who can wonderfully heal. And we just pray, Lord, this morning that you'll draw alongside them, that you'll touch, you'll heal, you'll raise them back up to health, and you'll raise them back up to strength. We do know there's many from, from the church fellowship here who, who, who are unwell. We realize that many of us have maybe family members or friends or people we pray for. Draw alongside, we pray, and just touch and heal in a mighty way. Lord, we thank you for the preaching of your word. And we pray, Lord, for, your, for the preaching of your word right throughout our land the, today and in the coming days. Lord, that you will bless your word. Lord, that your word will go forth with power, with authority, and will change hearts and change lives. So we thank you for the privilege we have of gathering together. We thank you for the privilege we have of reading your word openly, freely, and spending time around it. And we pray, Lord, you'll bless us as we meet together, because we ask it all in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, we're going to read God's word first of all, and I want to uh, turn with me to Isaiah 40. And we're going to read a couple of verses there first uh, from Isaiah 40. And then we're going to move to uh, Second Chronicles, uh, back First and Second Kings, First, first and Second Chronicles, Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, Job. Uh, and really we're looking at Hezekiah. And we had been looking just at the thought of a personal revival last week. And we're looking at national revival because Hezekiah's real prayer and Hezekiah's desire is that God would move uh, amongst them as a nation and as a people. And I trust as we gather this morning that that will be the desire of our heart, uh, that God will move in our land and that God will do a work in our land. Isaiah 40, and we're just going to read from verse 9 uh, down to verse 11, the last three verses here. And it says, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. And then moving back to uh, 2 Chronicles 29, 
And we're going to read a few verses here uh, from this little portion. Second Chronicles 29, and we're moving into uh, where Hezekiah uh, began his reign when he was just 25 uh, years of age. Second Chronicles 29, and then we'll begin to read at verse 1 of the chapter together. And it says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 20 and 5 years old, and he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, and the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and Levites and gathered them together into the east street. And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have trespassed, and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs." Also they have shut up the doors of the porch and put on the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment and to hissing as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. And then from verse 12 down through to verse 14, you will see a list of names of those the Lord had called uh, for worship. We're going to leave them out. Some of their tongue twisters. We're going to move on to verse 15 uh, for easiness for myself. You can read them yourself as you go down along. Verse 15 says, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord and the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord and the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kidron and just one more verse down to verse 22 it said so they killed the bullocks and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And we'll finish there at the end of verse 22. And we trust God will bless his precious and infallible word uh, to our hearts. May I just once again uh, this morning give each and every one a very warm welcome. It's lovely to have uh, everyone here with us this morning and it's lovely to be able to gather together it's nice to have Aaron and the kids with us uh, over from England as well and Jeffrey and Carly and the family up from Dublin were here last week and we do welcome them all and every one of our own folks uh, out as well we welcome you uh, just a couple of announcements uh, Thursday uh, the prayer meeting and the Bible study uh, continues up in the hall there'll be none online uh, for this month but God willing we'll be starting up uh, again in uh, September. Now, as far as I know, I think Jeffrey's taking the Bible study on Thursday night, isn't that right? So, it's quarter past eight. Jeffrey's on his holidays, but I see he still has to do something for his father when he tells him, isn't that right? Willie, Willie's still the boss. 
so he's told him. So Jeffrey will be there uh, on Thursday night, so please do make a special effort to come out to the prayer meeting and the Bible study there up in the church, and that's at quarter uh, past eight. And then next Sunday, 11.30 next Sunday morning, we're glad to have Mr. Gary Totty. Gary Lord works along with the Faith Mission. Uh, they're in the Oma district, uh, living in Oma, and Gary will be here, and he'll be ministering the word uh, next Sunday morning, and that will be online as well so please do uh, remember that now that's all the announcements uh, for the coming week uh, just to let you know um, that i will be heading away for a few weeks holidays um, uh, starting well when i finish here i'll be heading off on the holidays how's that we'll put it that way uh, but uh, just to say if anybody does want anything or need anything i know that many of you have my number uh, please do uh, feel free to contact me or contact either the two willies or gregory don't bother contacting folter he's away on his holidays so he'll not answer you uh, but if you contact any of the deacons i'm sure they'll help you and please i'm not out of the country and if anybody does need anything uh, i will be around so uh, just to remember that now that's all the announcements uh, for the coming week we're going to sing another hymn and then the two uh, junior classes will be able to head out uh, to sunday school and we'll meet around uh, God's word together. Hallelujah uh, for the cross. We're going to be meeting uh, around the Lord's table a little later on after we finish this part of the service, but we, we, we never forget the cross and we never forget to preach Christ and Christ crucified. That's the tremendous message of the church. Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously and there he bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross. And on that day, the word was changed a final perfect lamb was slain. We read there about them slaying the bullocks and the, the lambs. And uh, then, behold, the Lamb of God, as Paul said, who taketh away the sin of the world, Christ laid down his life. Let earth and heaven now proclaim hallelujah for the cross. Let's stand together and we'll sing this hymn through. And then immediately after that, the younger ones will head out to Sunday school. Thanks, Greg.
Thanks, Greg. Folks, I did forget just a few announcements. The word for today is there. I know that many of you get the word for today. That's the new one for August, September, and October. So if you haven't got your copy, I've left them out just there at the front. Uh, so please do uh, lift your copy. Also over there on the, on the little table, uh, that's the, the leaflets for the drive-in in Letterkenny. I know that some were asking about it. So that's, uh, it was to be two weeks, but now it's continuing on. Uh, the Neil T. Blaney Road, just opposite Aldi there in the bypasses, the folks from the Gospel Hall. And that's this afternoon uh, from half three to four o'clock. So that's the wee leaflet for that. And I know if you go along, the folks will appreciate uh, the support there. So that's the drive-in service. Also, uh, Liz McCarroll, uh, please do remember the, the, the park and ride there, uh, just there at Drumahoe. Uh, life story tonight of David Martin. Uh, it says, the breakup of home life by alcohol uh, led David's young life to spiral downward until an encounter with Christ in prison uh, changed his life. So please do remember that tonight. That's at Liz McCarroll there in the park and ride at Drumahoe, and that's at uh, 8 p.m., the folks. And then from then on, the rest of August, just remember it is at 7. I know that the number of you go into it, uh, but tonight's at 8, but then following that, uh, John Weir, the evangelist, will be there the following week, and then it's at 7 o'clock uh, from then on. So please do remember those in your prayers, and if you can get along, I know you'll be made most welcome. Let's just bow for a short word of prayer uh, before we turn to God's word. Our loving and our gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again that we can come into your presence. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the reading of your word, and you tell us that your word shall not return unto you void. And we pray now, Lord, you'll bless the preaching of your precious word to our hearts. Take the word and, Lord, just imprint it upon our hearts, we do pray. May we have those minds that are open and longing to please our God and longing to live a life that's honoring to you because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles or if you look on your phone, you can turn with me there to uh, 2 Chronicles 29, and we're looking really at the idea of a national revival and revival in our land. Uh, we've been looking at the circumstances behind as they look back, and we looked right in Isaiah 40 there, the voice of pardon, the voice of providence, uh, the voice of promise. Then we looked at the voice of power, and the final thought we brought there was just the voice of his presence. And the wonderful thing is that that is something that we need. We do need his presence, whether in our own lives each and every day to lead and guide and direct, or even as a nation, we need God to lead and guide and wonderfully direct our nation. And sadly, uh, many times, I suppose, preachers like myself have said that we have a nation that is going away from God instead of coming towards God. And some of the realities we're going to look here at what had to be done, I believe will have to happen in our own land in these days before God can come and before God can bless. There was a great breaking down of anything that was spiritual. There was a closing of the temples and a, a breaking down of their relationship with God. And that has to be built up and it has to be brought back into its proper place. And sadly, we can have a nation that is going away from God and thinking nothing of God. When we long in these days for a nation that's going to turn around and turn to God. And here in First, uh, or uh, sorry, in Second Chronicles 29, and on into verse 30 as well, or chapter 30 as well, we can see a number of things that had to take place for God to move in the land. Uh, first thing I want to look at uh, this morning is in verse 3. He said, he in the first year of his reign, right in the very beginning of his reign, and if you read back into verse 2, you'll see, or verse 1, is it that he reigned 29 years. But right at the very beginning, he set down his rules for life. And I think that's a wonderful thing to be able to do, no matter whether you're taking charge within church life, no matter whether it's taking up a position within church life, no matter whether it's, it's work within church life, to, to set up your position here. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, right at the very beginning, he opened up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he repaired them. Now, the sad reality, when we look back, they had been closed. 
Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, had shut the temple doors. He had taken out the vessels. He had destroyed all the vessels, the vessels that were used unto God and for the worship and the witness of God. He had destroyed them all. And he had shut the doors and he had forbidden worship to God and he had built idols in different parts of the land and he had gone and he had worshipped these idols. Now Hezekiah and his son, in the very first month of his reign, he nailed his colors to the mast and he says, we're going to open up the doors and we're going to worship the true God. And folks, the reality is when we look around us today, the sad reality in church life is that many of the churches are closing. The numbers are getting far less that are, are coming out to church. And that's one of the greatest difficulties in church life for many today. We see a downgrading. And the reality is there needs to be a turning again to God in our land. There needs to be, instead of a closing of the churches, we need to see them opened up. We need to see people coming in. We need to see people looking to God and listening to God's voice. And folks, the place begins when we see a worship towards God. You see, what had to happen here was, folks, the doors had to be opened and they had to be repaired. It's not only sad to see that they were closed, but we can see that they were broken down. And the reality is when you see revival coming in any place, and if you take time to read about revival, you will see that the doors of the church are opened up. And you will see that there's a gathering of the people back in and a filling up of the churches. I had the privilege of being up there in, in the Isle of Lewis. And if Caldwell was here this morning, he could speak more about, about the Isle of Lewis and tell you more about all that was happening there. But I had the privilege of giving my testimony one night and telling about what the Lord had done in that place in Barvis where the revival came and God blessed. And afterwards, I remember going up and I, I remember the minister at that time telling me, he said, you know, during the time of revival, they built the balcony at the back of the church because there wasn't enough within the church to hold it. And he said that so many gathered in that the balcony actually sunk. And there, if you go into that church today, you can see the balcony is, is bowed into the center. Once it was straight, but it's bowed in because people had a mind to worship. And people got their right position. They wanted to come in and they wanted to worship God. The altar was repaired. That's really what they're saying here. We're not talking about repairing the doors because they were closed. But what needed to be repaired was the altar. And the altar speaks of our relationship with God and our worship to God. And one thing that the people need more than ever in these days is a real relationship with the true and living God. And I want to ask you this morning, folks, each and every one, and even those looking on, do you have a real relationship with God? And I believe if there's a real relationship with God, if there's a desire to go on with God, then we will see our places of worship filled again. We will see a desire for people to be in the place of worship and to worship God because there will be such a desire in the heart that you'll want to be worshiping God. You'll want to be in his presence. You'll long to be there with him. And folks, if we're to see God moving in our land and God coming again, there will be a gathering up. The doors will be opened. The place of worship will be there because there will be a relationship and there will be worship towards God. If you turn back there to chapter 28, and I think it's verse 24, and you look at the picture there before, and you can look at the picture afterwards. It says in verse 24, And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God, cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every single corner of Jerusalem. That's what Ahaz did. Now look at what Hezekiah is doing, his son. A complete change about. I remember when Asia Link was here, Gordon Stewart was here, and, and he talked about Korea, North Korea especially. 
And he said today, he said North Korea is just, is just communism and it's communist worship. And he said they've done away with the things of God. But the thing that, the thing that really stuck in my mind was that a hundred years before, there had been revival in Korea. The places of worship had been full. The church was full to capacity, and the church was growing. And then communism came in. The churches were closed, and the worship to God was closed. And folks, it's a dark, dark place today. The difference between South Korea and North Korea, where one God is put out, and the other God is worshipped. God forbid that our land would turn to the darkness of North Korea because we need the light in these days and we need to worship God. The second little thought here in verse 10, as you move on, the covenant was made with the Lord. Now it is in mine heart, it says in verse 10, to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. And really what we're talking about here, I'm not going into covenanting or, or what it is. It's a new te an Old Testament uh, word. And, and, and folks, but the reality was there had to be a change of heart. That's what I want to say this morning. There had to be a change of heart amongst the people. You see there in, in Jeremiah, it says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I believe in our land today, there has to be a change of heart amongst the people. You see, there's, a, there's, there's the heart of the people are following after the things of the world. And folks, we're living in a land today where there is, yes, they have come through a difficult time and, and maybe in many ways still going to be going through a difficult time. But sadly, we haven't a nation that has turned back to God. We maybe have a few that have turned to God. We maybe have a few that have seen God. But what we need is, is a nation to turn. What we need is a nation to change their heart and to turn back to God. The, inst the instance I was thinking of when I, when I thought of this was, was Jonah. Do you remember Jonah went to preach to the people of Nineveh? And he started preaching three days' journey outside of Nineveh. And yet when he got to the palace and eventually got to the king, there was mourning. Because they had turned away from the true God, because they, had, because they had, were worshiping idols, and they put on sackcloth and they put on ashes, and they turned back to the true God. There was mourning, there was repenting for what they've done against God. And God changed, and God repented, it says in the scriptures, of, of that which he said he would do. And God saw that there was repentance amongst the people. He saw that the people had turned again to God. And folks, I thought to myself, isn't that what we need in our land today? You know, we need to faithfully preach the word. We need to faithfully tell people. But there needs to be a turning of a nation's heart back to the true and living God. Verse 15, the priests and Levites it says here, we're sanctified. There in verse 15, it says, they gathered their brethren. Now, as you know, I didn't read from verse 12 down through to verse 15 or 14. That's the name of all the ones there whom God called. And the idea was he called these, these men out to do a work for him. And then he goes on to say, and they gathered their brethren, they gathered them all together and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of of the Lord. Yes, the king called him, but it was God who was calling them. And he said, to cleanse the house of the Lord. But before they cleansed the temple and sanctified it, they cleansed the people and they sanctified the people. And God raised up men who were going to be faithful in their witness and in their worship. God raised up men here that were going to be active and were going to be zealous for the glory of God. And folks, can I say when God has a work to do, he will always raise up those 
who will lead, who will guide, who will direct, and who will have a desire in their hearts to bring a nation back to God. And folks, I love reading of revivals. And you know, you can see the men and women who were used of God in revival and in revival blessing. And I suppose the challenge I want to, want to bring out of this this morning, sometimes he doesn't use the leaders of the rank and file. God takes those who are desirous of his glory. God takes those who want to do a work for him. God takes those who love him. And he takes them and he sanctifies them. That word sanctify, folks, can I say this morning, is just those who want to be given over to God. That's all that word means, to be set apart for God. And I want to ask you this morning, is that the desire of your heart, folks, that you will, God will take me and that I will be given over to him, that I will be set apart for him? The hymn, write, the hymn writer penned those lovely words where he says, take my life and let it be consecrated. We could put in the word sanct sanctified there. And we could say, sanctified unto thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. You see, God worked amongst the people, his own people. And any form of revival, God takes those people that he can use. And he wonderfully uses them. Sometimes we talk about a nation and a nation coming back to God. It always begins in the house of God, amongst the people of God. In the scripture it says, if my people which are called by my name, if my people, his own people, you here this morning who are willing to give your life to God and allow him to take it. The priests and the Levites were sanctified. As we move on in verse 15, down at the bottom, it says to cleanse the house of the Lord. The temple was sanctified. In church life, folks, we can get, get caught up sometimes with so much baggage. And I mean this very reverently. Sometimes we can get caught up with so much how we do something rather than the message we're bringing. We can get so much caught up with all the paraphernalia around it that we forget what we're trying to tell the boys and girls, the young people, the men and women. We forget the true message. And we forget to lead them to the one who can make a difference in their hearts and their lives. You see, we're here to glorify God. We're here to worship God. We're here to lift God up. And folks, there's a couple of little things here I want to look at because church life needs to be filled with the worship and the praise of God. What's the object of our worship? The object of our worship is the Father and the Son. That's why when we go to the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're here to worship God. Scripture says, My glory will I not give to another. That's what we're here for. We're here to lift God's name up. We're not here to lift a denomination. We're not here to lift a people. But folks, we're here to lift God up. He's the worship. He is worthy of our worship. And folks, we're here to lift the sun up. If I, the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture says, be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That is the object of our worship. God the Father and God the Son. You know, sometimes when we, we come to worship and we listen to services, I think we're, we're blessed maybe in many ways at this time because we can listen to so many different services online. But sometimes I wonder, well, who is the worship truly going to? We're to worship God, Father and Son. The object of worship, the, the power for our worship, well, it's very simple. The power for our worship is, is the Holy Spirit. You know, I was listening to, to, to uh, the Bible study there during the week while he was speaking, and, and he was talking about salvation, and he says, God's Spirit comes in at salvation. Willie, Willie was, he was asking me earlier, did I watch it? 
And then he asked me, was there any heresy? Well, I said, Willie, now I don't think there was. I think you were all right and uh, everything was good. But, but one of the points he made was that the Spirit of God comes in at salvation. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. And the Spirit indwells us. The Spirit empowers us. The Spirit enriches us. We can go into so many things, the use of the Holy Spirit. But folks, we need the Spirit of God in our worship. As the Spirit of God convicts of sin. It's the Spirit of God gives the, gives the, the wonderful assurance of salvation, doesn't it? That we're born again. His Spirit bears witness that why Spirit, that I am a child of God. You know, some people say to me, Mervyn, how did you know you were saved? Because the Holy Spirit revealed himself to me and told me I was saved. I know I'm saved. And I know there's many here who can say the very same. That's the power for our worship. We need the Spirit of God amongst us. I remember hearing of a missionary uh, a good while ago, and, and they said, you know, that they came back to mission here in, in, in this part of the world, uh, right throughout Ireland. And they said one thing they realized was there was a lack of the, of the true Spirit of God in the meeting. And you know the thing that they did say from the pulpit that shocked me said the majority of people didn't even realize it. Folks, I wonder do we realize our need of the Spirit of God? And I wonder do we realize that the Spirit of God is in the midst? Wasn't, wasn't it Samson who said he wist not that the, the presence of the Lord had departed from him? He didn't even know. He went out to do what he thought he could do before. But God's presence was gone. God's presence in the Holy Spirit is with us today, and we need him in power and in authority. Not only the object, not only the power, but there's the, the place of worship. And there it's, it's within the veil or inside the veil. Hebrews 10 and 20 says this, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, let us draw near with a true heart. And the reality is when we come to, to God in worship, we're inside the veil. You see, when Christ died upon the cross, the, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. That meant access, that we can go directly into his presence. I wonder, do we take up that privilege regularly and faithfully? Do we have that desire within our hearts to come directly into his presence? You see, the, the priest was only allowed in, or the high priest, once a year, inside the veil. That's all. You know, then, after, after Jesus died, it was open. We could all go in. There's access inside the veil for you and me to come to him. And then there's acts of worship. Folks, we could go into many things here, but I believe one of them that's important, how do we come before God in worship? And if you want to turn to Romans 12, 1 and 2, many will know that off by heart, but there is the presentation of our body as we come before God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And this is one of the words in the, at the end of that verse that, that I always come to, that it is your reasonable service. It's not above. It's not beyond. It's not far-fetched, folks. This is what God asks of you, and it's a reasonable thing for him to ask. We present our bodies. You see, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. And folks, we're given over to him. He is to be in charge of our life. Do we regularly present our bodies to him? And do we say, listen, take my life and let it be. Also praise and I think sometimes we, we, we could learn a lot of lessons from, from, from a lot of other churches as I've looked at some of them and how they, how they praise and they worship God. But, but it's not only in music and, and, and in other things, but the reality is, is the true praise coming from the heart. And folks, we need to be a people because the psalmist said it is right to give praise unto our God. And folks, when we come in as a part of an act of worship, is there praise in our hearts to God? for all that he has done for us and for all that he's doing for us. Are we giving him praise? Is there praise upon our hearts? That's the challenge. Thanksgiving, 
there just quickly. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. How many times do we ask something for God, but neglect to come back and give him thanks? How many times as a church, even in the prayer meeting, do we ask and ask, but yet forget to give thanks to God for his goodness and his faithfulness and his answering prayer? You see, the acts of worship, we present our body. The acts of worship, we give him praise. The acts of worship, folks, we give him thanksgiving. And then the last one here, the act of worship, is that we communicate the gospel to those around. I was greatly challenged. And folks, I've spoken even to one or two of late about the gospel. Maybe I hadn't been forthright in before. But it it, it was just that little booklet I lifted there, one in ten that if one person tells 10 others about the gospel, will the church grow? And they're doing that in in that part of the country, and God is wonderfully blessing them. And I'll give that challenge out again this morning. Share the gospel with 10 people through the remainder of this year. Share it with them. Communicate it with them. Let them know what Christ has done for you, he can do for them. And folks, the reality is, the scripture says, if we're ashamed of him down here, he will be ashamed of us up there. Folks, how does God move? He moves in his own time and in his own way. But I believe he uses his own people. He can take you and he can wonderfully use you. The next little thought there in verse 16, folks, it says, In verse 16, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. It says, sorry, just at the end. It says, And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it, they carried it out abroad into the brook Christian. The the temple was cleansed. The temple was cleansed. And folks, sometimes things can creep into the heart and lives of individuals where there needs to be cleansing. And can I say we have to be careful in church life because there are things that can creep into church life that need to be taken out and put out and cleansed. That's why we guard church life. That's why we guard the preaching of the word. That's why we're careful in what we say and in what we do. Paul's letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, but says, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. How thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God. It says the church of the living God, the pillar and the true ground. I remember somebody saying to me recently, and this was regarding some meetings I was at, and there was tremendous division in the middle of the meetings. There were things that were said should never have been said. And there was a minister sitting beside me, and he turned to me and he said, you know, he said, when I was in the pub, in the world, he said, that wouldn't have been said what was said in these meetings. And I thought to myself, isn't that sad? Isn't that sad that so-called Christians in the middle of meetings together and what was said? You know, those thoughts and those actions, they need to be taken out. And folks, there needs to be cleansing. What did Jesus himself do? Didn't he take the sellers? Didn't he take the, the peddlers? Didn't he take the money changers and he overturned the tables and he said, you're not going to make my house a den of thieves. This is a house to worship and praise him. The temple in that day had to be cleansed. The last little thought here, the sacrifice was offered. There in verse 22, I didn't read it, but turn over down to verse 22. And it says, so they killed the bullocks. Sorry, I didn't read it. They killed the bullocks and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. Sacrifice, 
It's the giving up of something valuable for the sake of something else so that the item given up will attain a great personal cost. When we go back to the Old Testament, the animals had to be killed. It was a continual sacrifice. Books, but folks, this morning, I want to bring you into the New Testament. When we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, he laid down his life for you and me. He shed his precious blood for you and for me. He said, I lay my life down. Nobody took it from him. He freely laid it down. I always love the words of John when John said, Behold the Lamb of God. That was explaining what the Old Testament was about, bringing it into the new. Now Christ was going to lay down his life and shed his precious blood. Folks, I can never make enough of the finished work of the cross of Calvary. I can never say enough, folks, of all Christ has done for me upon the cross. You know, sometimes the cross doesn't move Christians. And I can't understand. Because it's all in the cross. It's all in Christ's finished work. And you know, folks, that's the main element of our preaching, is to preach Christ and Christ crucified. You know, next year, if I'm spared, I've been 30 years in Christian ministry. And the desire and the love for the Lord and the desire to preach Christ is still the same today as when I started 30 years ago. I love him. I love him. And I love to tell others about him. Someone once said, we preach Christ and Christ crucified. That's the message. Because it's the only message that can change lives. If I preach a church, it's not going to change your life. If I preach of a denomination, it's not going to change your life. If I preach of good works, it's not going to change your life. The only one who can change your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He can make all things new. And what he's done for me, he can certainly do for you. What's the results here, folks? Verse 30, very quickly. Hezekiah rejoiced, sorry, of chapter 29. Hezekiah rejoiced and all the people. You see, the results of a nation turning back to God is Hezekiah was rejoicing. The children of God, the people of God rejoicing. Folks, wouldn't there be great rejoicing if we saw the church full, if we saw God working amongst our families, amongst our land, in our nation, and a nation turning back to God. Hezekiah rejoiced. The Christians, God's people, were rejoicing. And then go into chapter 30 and verse 36. And it says this, or 26, sorry. So there was great joy in Jerusalem. There was not only rejoicing in the house of God amongst the people of God, but can I say there was rejoicing in the land. And folks, when you see and read of God moving within the land, it always brings rejoicing. If you take time to read of the revival in Wales in 1904, you will hear of, of the valleys turning to song with the presence of God. I remember my father, with this I close, time has gone. I remember my father telling a story years ago of when they were missioning up in the highlands of Scotland and he said, God came into that mission. And he said, there was people saved. He said, it was a revival in the town. He said, the pubs closed down. He said, for the meeting, every other place in the town closed. And he said, all you saw every night was people coming from all the different parts with the wee tilly lamps singing. And then he said, you went out at the end of the meeting. And he said, all you saw them was dis disappearing into the countryside, singing. And that all was stuck in my mind, that story. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see that again? People singing as they're coming in to worship God. People singing as they're going out. And a 
l'amour et dans l'âme. Amen. Folks, we're going to just sing a few verses of another hymn. Then we'll close in a wee word of prayer. And then we'll meet around the Lord's table together. I know this is a favorite of many. Just in closing, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. We'll stand together and we'll just sing the first two verses here and then we'll close in a wee word of prayer and then we'll, we'll meet around the Lord's table. Thanks, Greg. sense of your presence with us and as we turn off online now and as we go and meet around your table together we pray that that sense of your presence will continue with us and you'll minister to our hearts because we ask it in your worthy name amen